Hey, we are uh, finishing 2 Timothy today. Somebody say hurrah. We have been in 2 Timothy all summer, and so as we finish out the summer, uh, they, uh, th- this morning we will take this last section of 2 Timothy. And this morning as we finish up our journey through 2 Timothy, uh, I want to return to something that I said at the beginning of 2 Timothy. I'm sure you all remember it like it happened yesterday, right? Uh, but here's one of the things that I said as we started in 2 Timothy, a question that I posed for you. And the question was this, have you grown spiritually in the past year? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer out loud. Have you grown spiritually in the last two years, in the last five years? Can, can you see? We put this, uh, oh, I thought we were going to have the tree up. But the tree's not up. That's okay. I, I, I gave you an illustration uh, back then. There it is. Uh, this great tree that we've been putting up throughout the, uh, I didn't give them sermon notes today, so I think they thought they were on vacation. They didn't have to put it up there. So there it is. Growing deeper, look at Second Timothy. This great tree, right? And, and I, I admitted, right, in, in my own faults, in my own failures, uh, that, that I have been challenged with, with what, whether, my, my, whether my spiritual health reflects the fact that I have been in a 44-year continual growth pattern in my journey with Jesus. Does my life reflect that I've been in a 44-year growth pattern in my journey with Jesus? Does that, does that growth pattern show me as one like this great oak tree uh, along the water? Or does my spiritual growth sort of look like a sapling or, or maybe a small dogwood, right? Instead of this grand oak tree. How is it that we are intentionally growing deeper in our faith? And we have recognized that through that humbling question, hopefully a challenging question, that we could realize that, that this is the very thing that is at the core of Second Timothy. So, for good times, uh, since this is the last week in Second Timothy, let me ask you a few questions, right? This is not rhetorical. I anticipate that you'll know the answers to these, right? So who wrote 2 Timothy? It wasn't overwhelming, but that was all right. Some of you, some of you re- remember, right? So Paul wrote 2 Timothy. Where, where was he when he wrote 2 Timothy? He was in prison, right? A- and even in prison in such a way that he was anticipating his execution at any moment, right? So these, we know, are the last words written by the Apostle Paul as he writes to somebody who I'm going to ask you next. So who is it that he writes to? Timothy. Uh, one person is getting more zealous of the reality of the answer. All right, so that, that's good. So, so he writes to Timothy. Timothy has been a mentee to Paul, a, a son in the faith, if you will. Timothy has traveled with Paul through much of the second missionary journey, the third missionary journey, and then that incredible journey to Rome where there was shipwreck and all those things. Timothy has been with him. And, and now Timothy is pastoring the first church of Ephesus, right? And, and so Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus and through Timothy to the church of Ephesus. And by God's grace, we have these words that now minister to us. So Paul writes to Timothy. And, and why is it that he writes to Timothy? What's the purpose? Grow deeper. There. Ha. Five of you remembered that. That's good. All right, so grow deeper. And and listen, growing deeper, not just because we need to be smarter about biblical truth, right? This isn't about academia as much as it's about an awareness of the gospel, an awareness of the gospel. Because when we are ever aware of the gospel, we will grow in our relationship with Jesus and excel at being inspired to tell others about him. We will be reminiscent of that great oak tree. And so this is what it is that Paul is writing about. I quoted MacArthur that first week that said this, no true believer is completely satisfied in his spiritual growth. That's a challenging statement. No true believer is ever satisfied in his spiritual growth. Mark Deaver, at the end of a very long quote that I shared that week, I'll just give you the short version this morning. At the end of that quote, he said, When something stops growing, it's dying. And I think that's evident and true of the reality of our spiritual journey as well. So this is our final week in 2 Timothy. And at first glance, this passage is going to seem to be a weird one. There's a lot of personal thoughts and facts for Timothy. We might ask, why is this part of the inspired word of God? 
But hopefully today, we will see that Paul finishes here where he starts. That is with the amazement at the gospel. At the love of God and the work of Jesus. It's just a very weird but raw way of getting there. So let's read the text together. I'll read it out loud. You can follow along. Uh, it's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. Uh, that's on page 996 of your pew Bibles if you want to pull those out. Or if you've got your own copy of God's word today, I'll give you a chance just to turn there. 2 Timothy 2, 9 through 22. If you have an electronic device, you're cheating at this point because you just type that in and it brings it right up, right? As you turn there, let me give you my sermon in a sentence, right, that helps us so that hopefully you see that in the text. Certainly, hopefully you see it by the end of the morning. And that is this, growing deeper always returns us to the gospel. Growing deeper always returns us to the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. This is the very word of God. Paul writes, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all this, the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. May God help us in the understanding of his word. Two points this morning. I know it's an abbreviated Presbyterian sermon, only two points, but I've made them longer so you won't get out earlier, right? Two points this morning, and that is this. Paul feels alone, but in his aloneness, he remembers the gospel. Let's look first at the evidence that I think is here that Paul feels alone. Listen, we might be tempted to flip through these verses quickly, a bunch of weird personal greetings, move on to what is next, but I want you to stop and, and I want us to feel the weight of what, is, what Paul is saying in these early verses. He's saying, I am lonely. I don't know that we can imagine what it would be to be in that cell awaiting your beheading but even that is not all that's expressed in these verses. Uh, the verses catch me because I, I've always get the feeling that Paul is pretty self-sufficient. He's kind of always that in control kind of guy, right? He's got everything together. That he's wired not to really need anyone, but he's obedient to put people around him. But these verses prove otherwise. At least at this very vulnerable moment before his death. Listen to him. He has spent the vast majority of this letter giving Timothy instructions regarding the church, right? He's saying, hey, Timothy, you need to do this, do this, be careful of this, watch out for these guys. He's doing all of this. But yet when we come to this verse in 9, it says, do your best to come to me soon. That seems odd. Giving you all of these instructions, but now this instruction is to come to me. Why? Well, for one, Demas, a, a guy who has been a faithful friend to Paul, whom we can see in associations with Luke and other epistles of Paul, someone who Paul probably has discipled, has been alongside of Paul much in his journey, Demas has deserted him. He's deserted him. 
get this, someone who has labored in the gospel with Paul on these missionary journeys has seemingly departed even from the faith because he has fallen in love with the present world. Ah, there's a lot to that. Maybe a lot of questions that you want to text to that number that we gave you last week because there's a lot of interesting things, right? right? To understand about Demas. But what I really want you to feel this morning, and I think why Paul writes these letters, he writes them out of his sorrow. You feel the weight of that? One whom I've invested in, one who I've been nurtured by, one who has been a good friend, has not only left me, but has left the faith because he's in love with the present world. Then there is Crescens and Titus, seemingly also with him at Rome at one point, but have been now favorably commissioned to Galatia and Dalmatia. Hear that. I don't think Crescens and Titus are in the same category as Demas. I think Paul has seen their abilities and their gifts. They have journeyed, and, and now they are being commissioned. And so Paul at some point has taken Crescens, and he said, I want you to go to Galatia. He's taken Titus, and he says, I want you to go to Dalmatia. And even though Paul is feeling lonely, he realizes that the word of God needs to be taught elsewhere, and that there's a higher priority priority to him than his loneliness, and that is for the sake of the kingdom. If you've ever said goodbye to adult children to places like Arkansas, right? If you've ever said goodbye to good friends to go serve in other places, you understand that heartache, right? This is a good thing you're going while you weep at their going. I think that's the sense of Crescens and Titus here. I know this is good, but it hurts, and I'm lonely. He goes on, he says, Luke alone is with me. To which Luke might want to say, what am I, chopped liver? Right? I, I, <laughs> here I am. Not, not really. Paul's point is certainly not demeaning. Probably his closest friend, one who traveled with him in much of, again of the second and third missionary journeys, as well as that awful boat ride to, to, uh, to Rome as his doctor and as his friend. Luke is not chopped liver at all. The point is that there have been, some estimate, up to 100 men and women who have been in and out of Paul's life as friends and partners in the gospel. And now as he prepares to die, Luke is the only one there. So to Timothy, he says, another great friend and partner in the gospel, will you please come to me soon? And he says, bring with you Mark. Now, this is a fascinating story that, that I'll, I'll try to remind you of quickly. Do you remember this story? At, at the very end of Acts chapter 12, we see Mark joining Paul and Barnabas in the first missionary journey. If you go back to Acts chapter 12, you can read about that. Mark is a young man, and he's got interesting things about him that we've seen even in the Gospels. And, and yet he is, is one that has been committed to Christ and now committed to Paul. And so... Paul and Barnabas come to leave on their first missionary journey, and they take John Mark kind of as an apprentice. His mother must have been proud. What's your son doing? He's an apprentice to the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Isn't that great? Right, so here he goes, right, on the first missionary journey. But about halfway through that first missionary journey, what does he do? I miss my mommy. And he bolts, and he goes home. We don't know if it was because he missed his mommy, but we do know that he went home. He, he, he left the first missionary journey, and he returned to his home city. And so here Paul and Barnabas finished the first missionary journey, and, and in Acts 15, we see them getting ready to go on the second missionary journey. And getting ready for the second missionary journey, Barnabas has packed his bags. He's pulled everything up to the stagecoach or whatever it was, you know, the donkey, whatever it is they had, right? And, and he says, oh, by the way, I'm bringing Mark with me. And Paul goes, you're bringing who? Mama's boy who left us, who deserted us? That guy, you're bringing him? And it says in Acts 15 that there was a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. They had it out. And it was all about this guy, John Mark. Well, it ends up that the gospel went twice as fast to the rest of the world. Barnabas went one way with John Mark, and Paul went the other way. It literally divided them. And so you can imagine the reality of these feelings that exist between Mark and Paul. But we can also see through the Pauline epistles that there is healing being applied to those relationships. And then in here, in 2 Timothy, we see this beautiful reality of complete reconciliation. What does Paul say? Timothy. 
on your way. Get Mark. Because he is important to my ministry. You hear that? That's beautiful. Well, not only is that story beautiful, but I kind of like this next story. And I'm, I'm going to warn you, there's some speculation in my next story. Often I do warning Will Robinson, warning Will Robinson. This is speculation. This is nothing that's written in a book. It's nothing written in the Bible, right? And the reality of this is, is speculation. And uh, I don't know if I told you this story, but I have to pause. My, my, my daughter never got that because she never had the great pr- privilege of watching Lost in Space, right? Warning Will Robinson. And then came out the new Netflix version of Lost in Space, and she called me one day, and she goes, Dad, I get it now. I was watching Netflix, the new Lost in Space, and I get the whole warning thing. So if you don't get that, go back and watch the new Lost in Space on Netflix. Anyways, so here's the warning, right? Speculation. But but I want you to see what, what really could be true. Assuming that Timothy picks up Mark and gets to Paul and Luke before Paul's execution. I want you to think for a second who's sitting in this circle. Luke, right? Who will write more in the New Testament than any other writer in the writing of Luke. It, it, because he wrote the, the book of Luke and Acts. So the, by word and number of words, Luke has written more of the New Testament than anybody else. Luke is in this circle. Mark, who's probably already written his gospel record. Paul, who has written all these profound letters to the churches, and Timothy, who has traveled with Paul through most of his second and third missionary journeys, as well as the fateful boat ride to Rome. Think about who's in this circle. Now take that and consider what Paul also asked Timothy to bring. He says, bring a winter coat. That's because it's going to get cold. And then he says, bring the scrolls and the parchments. The, The scrolls being written material. Maybe even the gospel that Mark has already written in the scroll, right? Bring that, as well as the Old Testament writings that we have to to get together. And then bring parchments. What are parchments? Well, they're the very things that Paul would write on. He says, Timothy, bring my scrolls and my parchments because we got work to do. Because check this out. If we put Luke and Mark and Paul and Timothy all in the same room, what could happen? I speculate that the gospel of Luke is being written. I speculate that Acts is being written because these guys are in a room going, hey, what should we write? What should we write? Let's ask Jesus, oh, come on, what should we write? And they're writing literally the New Testament in a prison cell maybe days, months before the execution of Paul. Now, why do I get so excited about that? Because, first of all, it's really cool to think about. But even if you're not a geek like me, as Paige would say, even more this. What Paul is thinking as he writes these words is going to be a cure to his loneliness. That he's not looking for some kind of pity party when they all get there, but that he realizes that his days are numbered to be a part of the input to the sacred writing that we now have as the Bible, and that in his loneliness, he is thinking about the kingdom. Timothy, come to me soon. There is work to be done. A couple more real quick. Paul tells Timothy, I have sent Tychicus with this letter as I have done others because he is able to take over for you in Ephesus while you are gone. Tychicus is one that would have stepped into Ephesus as the pastor if indeed Timothy would leave to come to Paul. And then Paul ends as he begins sadly with yet another who seemingly walked with Paul at one point but now testifies against the gospel. His name is Alexander. And it comes with a warning to look out for him as well. Paul is lonely. Timothy, come to me soon. Do you feel the weight of this? Do you see vulnerability (laughs) in someone that we have always kind of thought had it all together? Well, I think Paul felt it. I think Paul realized it. But this is what brings us to a really crucial part of this text. Because the thing that helps Paul in that moment is not that Timothy suddenly shows up or that there is suddenly a crowd and a party in his cell. The thing that encourages him, that helps him, is the gospel. And and, and this is important, right? Uh, The years of growing deeper in Paul's personal journey with Jesus has prepared him for this very raw moment in which he remembers 
the gospel. Verses 16 and 17. In verse 16, Paul's mind looks in the rearview mirror to look for answers to his loneliness. Most commentators in most early writings believe that Paul is remembering the trial prior to his first imprisonment. Some will say it's a more recent trial prior to his second imprisonment. It doesn't really matter. They can all argue about that. It's a trial. And he's standing what? Alone. It says in verse 16, he's, he's, he's providing his defense and he's by himself. He says that no one came to stand by him, but all deserted him. He adds that the Lord will take care of them. <laughs> Interesting. But then see the revelation for him in that time. As he remembers, as he recalls, as he looks in the rearview mirror, in the midst of his loneliness, he's remembering another extremely raw and lonely moment at the defense, everyone's against him. He stands alone. But what does he remember about that moment? That the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. There's some good reflection in that. Moments when we feel alone, moments when we feel as if everyone has left us, has deserted us, moments in which we feel maybe even that God has somehow been at a distance. To look in the rearview mirror and to remember yet another moment in which we understood and realized that God stood with us and strengthened us. When you take the story of faith class this fall, little hint, right? When you take the story of faith class Sunday mornings in the discipleship hour, discipleship hour this fall, you will learn a lot of really valuable stuff about the presence of God. And as if Paul had been through that class under Paige's great teaching, he is recognizing not just the presence of God in that moment, but the presence of God in all of biblical history. See, it's much more than Paul realizing that God was with him and strengthened him in that moment. But it is a, I believe, a gospel moment that the presence of God from the Old Testament all the way to that moment has been the very thing that has stood with his people and strengthened them. I mean, this earlier this year, we talked about the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. You should recall something about that. And, and we recognize that it was a profound moment, the, the, the reality that God was showing up in the tabernacle, that God would show up in the temple, that his presence was with his people, was mind-blowing. And then you get to the incarnation of Christ, where John says that Christ came and actually tabernacled among us, that in, in real life, in real person, the reality of God in the flesh has come to stand by us and to strengthen us. Paul in this instant may have recalled the stoning of Stephen, and I say that only because of the similar wording that is used. Remember this, Stephen has proclaimed the gospel and had been accused and convicted of the reality of being a part of the Christian movement, and he is about to be stoned, and oddly enough, Paul is the one set left in charge, holding the cloaks of all the people who are stoning Stephen. Paul was working for the other team at the moment. But Stephen in Acts 7, standing, being pummeled by stones, says this, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Uh, grab quickly the importance of the Lord standing in both of these instances, both for Stephen as well as Paul's recollection of the Lord standing with him. Often when Jesus is referred to in the heavenlies after the resurrection, after the ascension, what is he doing? He is sitting. And that's really profound. The Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 is, is an amazing verse of the reality of believing that Jesus says, hey, it's all done. I can take a seat. It is finished. Sin has been paid for. You have been paid for. Your eternal destiny has been paid for. The reality of this is done and I sit. But he's not sitting here for Paul, nor for Stephen. What is he doing? He's standing. 
hang on to this, it signifies that while all that Jesus is done, has done has accomplished for us salvation, that in desperate times, we are to still see Jesus standing. Why? Because in standing, he's fighting for us. Some would say that it's actually even an indication of his promise that he is coming back for us. I mean, Paul would have certainly remembered how throughout his life, Jesus had stood for him. He too had been stoned and left for dead. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's been scourged. He's been abandoned. And in those moments, how God always met him there. The presence of God means something. It certainly means that he shows up in our hard moments. But even more, it is at the very core of this gospel that Jesus shows up to live for us, to die for us, to rise again for us, that he might prepare a place for us where we'll be eternally in his presence. And get this, Paul understands the gospel presence in connection with gospel purpose. He says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. He didn't come with me in that defense, just so that I would know that he loves me, but so that I might be rescued from the lion, from from Rome's mouth, and go on another missionary journey, and that the Gentiles might hear the same gospel. Listen, this had to be a compelling and comforting thought to Paul as he writes it. Not that he was about to be rescued from martyrdom. I don't think he believed that. It wasn't going to be one of those moments where the walls shook and the chains fell, and he walked out a free man. I think he knew that he would die, but he knew that God had purpose in everything through his presence. Listen, even the things that we don't understand. Alistair Begg says, the Lord's presence in us is for the Lord's purpose for us. And that comes no matter what the circumstances we are in. And that leads us to what I think is the pivotal verse of these final words. Listen to Paul's confidence in remembering the gospel. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. (laughs) The presence of the Lord is not just for the comfort of our circumstances, but the assurance of our eternity. And this adds power to the fact that he promises to us to never leave us nor forsake us. He is with us all the way to heaven. If we find ourselves caught in deeds of our own, evil deeds of our own, there is forgiveness. Dick spoke well of that today. If we find ourselves caught in the evil deeds of others, there is deliverance and there is justice. The bottom line is that God is a God of rescue. This is the gospel. This is where Paul finds his comfort amidst his loneliness. And therefore, it's where his praise originates. Listen, Paul's writing. I can see him. He's writing it. He's getting it. Oh, man, it's gospel. And then he says, to him, to that God of rescue, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't miss, people of God, the transition and transformation of these these verses from come to me soon, Timothy, I'm lonely, to the Lord will rescue me. To him be the glory forever and ever. Can you recall a time in your life that you thought you knew what you needed? (laughs) Okay, that's most of my life, right? A time in your life where you thought you knew what you needed. And, And God, over time, revealed that while those things might have been good things, that they were not as complete and as sufficient as knowing the gospel. The presence of God that gives purpose of God. Paul thought he needed Timothy. (laughs) But in the process of calling out for him to come soon, he realized that God had never left him, stood with him, and strengthened him. I'm thinking that Prisca and Aquila needed that reminder as they labored in the church at Ephesus. That the household of Onesiphorus needed that, as I'm increasingly convinced that Onesiphorus has been martyred for his zealous faith. We read about that in chapter 1. 
that Erastus needs this in Corinth, Corinth and Trophimus needs this desperately as he is still in Miletus and very sick. Paul is not simply at the end of his letter saying hello to these. He's saying, listen, remember again the gospel. Remember again that no matter where you are, no matter how hard it is, the reality is is that God stands for you and that he strengthens you. Then these three final thoughts. You got to love the beginning of verse 21. Okay, Paul gets it that the gospel is enough. He praises God in it. He desires others to know it. But what? He still sneaks in, Timothy, it would be good if you got here before winter. How many of you are encouraged by that? I'm extremely encouraged by that. Like, I know in my head, I get it. I get it to gospel. He's always good enough. He's always strong enough. He's always there. He's always strengthening me. But man, Timothy, if you could get here before winter, that would be great. (laughs) The reality of our flesh still speaks out. And here at the very end, in the inspired word of God, we see the vulnerability of Paul. He knows it, and yet he still seeks for the reality of his flesh for Timothy to come before winter. (laughs) Then Paul sends greetings from a bunch of people that we've not heard of before and won't hear of again. But we are led to believe that they are actually Gentile believers. Some converted by Peter and some by Paul, but they are the harvest of the gospel. And in essence, Paul is saying, be encouraged, church, that even in the persecution that is happening in Rome, people are still getting saved. God is present, and he is strengthening his people. And then the final words. The first in the singular, so I think he's speaking specifically to Timothy. Timothy, may the Lord be with your spirit. And then the second in the plural, church, may grace be with you. They are great final words. They are gospel final final words. Don't miss it. It's not just, oh, by the way, here's a little blessing for you. It's the blessing of the gospel. May the Lord be a present, right? May the Lord be with your spirit. May the presence of God reflected in the tabernacle, the temple, and the Savior And the one to come, be with you, to stand with you in your circumstances, as well as lead you to eternity. Then this, grace be with you. Listen, the only way that we are rescued, the only way that we are forgiven, the only way that we are delivered is by God's grace. We've not earned it. We've not worked for it. It is by God's grace. And grace is exactly what God desires to give. So Paul finishes with the gospel. May his presence be with you. May his grace be with you as a God of rescue. How does Paul get from self-sufficiency that I'm going to fix this whole lonely thing in verse 9 to gospel dependency, recognizing that the Lord will rescue me in verse 18? Well, it's partly because this blessing probably spoken over him a couple dozen times. The Lord be with you. His grace on you. But I also say it is because Paul has spent countless hours growing deeper in his journey with Jesus. Because Paul has never been completely satisfied with his spiritual progress. And because of his depth, when he hit a pothole of loneliness, he quickly found truth. And it led to praise. And it ended in a blessing for others. People of God, how do we get from our self-sufficiency to God dependency? How do we so quickly get from the potholes of life that we tend to sink into, of, of wanting to fix it ourselves, to recognizing the power and the presence of God and the purpose of God and what he is doing even in that moment? It is by growing deeper. We don't grow deeper that we might memorize more verses. Memorization is good. We don't grow deeper so that we might become more biblically um, literate in the reality of what it says. Those are head things. The reality is is we, we, we read this book, we understand this book, and we grow deeper in our journey with Jesus. So when loneliness comes, when potholes come, when sin comes, when the reality of hardship comes, we too might respond quickly and remember God is present with us. 
and he stands to rescue us. The deeper we grow, the quicker we'll get to that conclusion in the hardest parts of life. So Paul says here, growing deeper always ends up at the gospel of recognizing a rescuing God. To the believer today, know Jesus more (laughs) to know that he will rescue you, stand for you, and strengthen you. Maybe to the unbeliever here this morning, uh, the one that washes in and out of trusting Jesus with your life, man, know that Jesus has you here this morning in the sound of this word, not mine, this word, that you might begin today to trust him more. To know that he has rescued you, that Jesus came, was present, lived for you, died for you, rose for you, and ascended for you. He sits at the right hand of God because he has completed all, but he stands at times to fight for you and to rescue you. Know that. Let's pray. God, may it be so. Lord, I would pray that even if there is one set of ears in this building, or even online today through the stream that has ever been uncertain of who you are, that has ever wavered in the reality of their trust and dependence on you. God, that we would run to you today, knowing that you stand for us and strengthen us, that you have rescued us not only from the lion's mouth of our circumstances, but you have rescued us from eternal hell. You have rescued us from our sin. You've you've rescued us from ourselves. God, would you by your spirit move into that one heart and reveal yourself in such a way today that they would run to you. And for many of us believers that waver in and out of this incredible journey with you, of moments where we believe it and get it and others in which we questioned it and doubt it, God, may you today create one more stone for the foundation that allows us to trust you all the more, believing that no matter where we are, no matter what circumstances we are in, that you are a God who rescues. You will rescue us from our circumstances, but even more, we know today that you have rescued us from our sin. We are grateful. And we sing our praise to you, to you, O God, be the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen.